Hi, my name is Simon and I welcome you all to another episode of Beyond Perception, where we are exploring who we really are and what better guest than my guest today. Yeah, it is a true pleasure to speak to John Brander Gast. He is a psychotherapist with almost four decades of experience, a supervisor of therapists, author of several books, including the Deep Heart, which I have here, and also more recently, a spiritual teacher. So welcome, John Prendergast. It is really a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Simon. It's lovely to be here. And I'm now retired as a psychotherapist. So uh, I'm, I'm really doing spiritual teaching and mentoring now, but uh, as of last September, so... Okay, your, okay. Your, your so, introduction is almost current. Almost correct. So co yeah. congratulations to, to your yeah. uh, re retirement. Uh, and mm. I, you might know this already, but the audience, not necessarily. I want to provide just a brief context about why we have this conversation today. Sure. Um, last year, I yeah, I had this marvelous encounter with Ramana Maharshi, um, which is an Indian sage and teacher yes and I, I have i have been to ramada's ashram i have sat in his cave mm -hmm. and yeah and, and and this yeah these days or the, the, this this time really changed perspectives on so many levels and it is it is hard yeah i, I don't know if it's even possible to describe in words like what exact exactly happened but it felt as seeing a truer version of who I am, yeah. Uh -huh. But then, at the, like, very closely, then also be thrown back into the realms of the ordinary I or Simon, uh -huh. yeah, my identity, and uh -huh. and that experience left me, yeah, quite confused for some time. It was difficult uh -huh. to to make, uh -huh. uh, make to make sense of it, and uh -huh. there was yes. a, a part which. I yeah, wanted to have this experience again and another one which wanted to understand what happened sure. and, uh -huh. and um, yeah that that led to yeah, basically a search for some answers which led me to find Timothy Conway uh -huh. with uh, whom I yeah also had a very wonderful conversation on this podcast a few I'm months sure. ago I'm sure who then introduced me to to you and your work and uh, oh. over the last I believe two months I have been reading your book uh, the deep heart um, yeah our portal to presence almost twice and um, yeah so thanks to Timothy we're having this conversation today so um, yeah that, that's a brief um, context I wanted to wanted to provide so um, uh -huh. and I, I might already um, yeah, just disclose that what I really love about your book um, is that it provides a very holistic perspective on who we truly are and how we might be able to discover and, and also embody that. And that has been very, um, that, that has been very unique to me, I must, must say. Yeah? It was kind of the first time that I saw the different pieces connected and um uh -huh. and as the title implies yeah the the the, the deep heart or you also refer to it as the great heart um as a portal to our true nature and and true nature or presence no, that those are words which you hear very often they're very often used but they might not mostly uh, unable to really sense the reality or the experience uh, they they might be referring to and uh, the, the essence behind and and, it, and i would love to start with that with that question yeah what what, what does uh, from your point of view or perspective experience yeah, what what is our true nature or what does presence mean i would say our true nature is loving awareness And that uh, awareness is not personal. It's, uh, we could say, transpersonal or impersonal, although the word impersonal in English often connotes a certain coolness or detachment. 
And that's not what I'm speaking of. Um, this awareness uh, is universal, meaning it's shared uh, by all beings. It's the foundation, actually, of all form. Uh, it's, it is that which everything comes from and returns to. Uh, I actually ha <laughs> happen uh, to have a coffee cup that, with a quote from Ramana Maharshi on it, it says, uh, you know, let what comes come, let what goes go, find out what remains. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's what's there, you know, in the absence of all form. And yet it's, it's in the center of all form as well. And, and often in our first contact with it, there's a sense as you've had a glimpse, obviously I can feel it. It's alive in you. Uh, <clears throat> often, it's on a more mental level of just kind of the mind is blown. You know, we realize we disidentify from our story and our thoughts. We tap into this infinite sense of awareness, uh, which can be very both liberating and disorienting. Um, mm -hmm. If we, as almost everyone does, take themselves as a limited separate self. So to tap into that unlimited infinite consciousness often brings a sense of great freedom and spaciousness and when people talk about it it's often up here but as we acclimate to it as we attune with it as we uh, consciously recognize what it is this awareness begins to actually we feel it dropping down and through the body and you use the word embody and this uh, I, I think of this process as embodied self-recognition and there are different portals to this. There's a portal of the mind, the portal of the heart, the portal of the hara. And each of these are openings into infinite awareness. Um, and yet each has a different flavor. And so opening of the mind, the flavor is that of freedom, spaciousness. Opening of the heart, it's unitive, love, um, gratitude, you know, profound, spontaneous gratitude to recognize who we are and what this life is. And, and the opening of the hara, uh, this lower center, uh, opens to a sense of profound stability, um, kind of a rock-like um, stability, uh, unshakable, regardless of what's happening, most difficult experiences we have as a human being. So, you know, I wrote the book, The Deep Heart, based on my own experience of opening and awakening, but also my work with clients and uh, students um, over many years, four decades, and more recently, you know, the work has been in small groups or large groups, <coughs> online or on retreat, and so on. So, you know, what is our true nature? Our true nature is beyond thought. It's beyond feeling and beyond perception, ultimately. It's the source of all of these and we know it um, directly um, it's a direct um, apprehension or intuition that comes to us um, and it's um, when we as we recognize this there's a feeling of coming home a deep sense of homecoming a deep sense of ease um, like we, we, we have knowingly or unknowingly been on a search our whole life. And as this recognition comes into conscious awareness, there's a, a deep sense of um, ease and, and coming home and you know, resting in you know, the core of who we are. And what's interesting is this awareness is shared. And so in the recognition of it here in this particular body mind, we also recognize it in others. And it's spontaneously evoked as we do so. You know, I, I feel it in you. I sense it in you, Simon, as well. You know, and that, that brings it more into the foreground. So there's this phenomena of it being um, shared, you know, non-separate uh, as the ground and, and heart of who we really are. Ultimately, we cannot grasp it, we cannot define it, and yet we can be it knowingly. 
Hmm. Wonderful. And one, I, I, I would say one of the, maybe for my mind, yeah, most helpful um, metaphors you provided in your book is the one about the wave and the ocean. Um, basically relating the three aspects or three identities available in our consciousness uh, that, that really uh, provided a very helpful uh, map to navigate or start navigating different levels of experience and yes. I believe that that would be also something uh, the audi audience would greatly uh, be interested to yeah, I'd be happy to elaborate. Yeah, elaborate on that. This is not an original metaphor. This mm -hmm. is actually a very traditional metaphor, mm -hmm. and you'll find it mm -hmm. in different contemplative traditions. Um, the wave in the ocean, and the wave referring to our individual expression in the ocean, to that <coughs> which we share with all beings. Mm -hmm. And when we take ourselves as a separate self, not only do we take ourselves as a, a separate waveform, but we're like the very tip of the wave. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't, we don't have a sense of what's supporting, um, what's foundational for both ourselves and all of life. And so we live in a state of anxiety. You know, we, we live as a separate self, as a fraction, actually, of, of the whole, um, not knowing our essential wholeness. And so we live... Um, we live in anxiety because we see that all forms pass, including, you know, our beloved friends and family, lovers. And there's always a sense of ungroundedness. There's a sense of shakiness. Uh, it can be acute uh, when uh, this existential condition of separateness is more in the foreground of awareness. It can be more subtle. And in the background of awareness, but something in us knows, you know, that uh, we're incomplete and partial, and that gives a sense of groundlessness and anxiety. So it's kind of like it's also like a fist, you know, it's like a contraction, and um, and as we begin to explore, as we into who am I really? What is this? that I call myself, that I experience as myself. Um, uh, not as a mental um, analysis, but more as an intuitive felt sense of this I that I take myself, this ich, you know, this je suis, you know, whatever the, the language is, uh, mm, the sense of I am, the sense of being as we allow our attention to drop more and more deeply, we have this sense of opening. And, and there's an unfolding of that contraction. Um, and sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll have openings into what really feels like infinite awareness. And that's opening to the ocean. You know, and it sounds like you had that experience um, in the past year. But on the way, there's another level, which um, is usually um, not addressed by most psychologies and also not addressed by most non-dual traditions, mm. which is a, it's an intermediate level, um, which I call the soul. It's an archetypal level, somewhere between the separate self and infinite shared unbounded awareness. And this is a, a very interesting and profound and deep level also um, explored more by Jungians, those interested in archetypes, medicine journeys, medicine work, um, where one feels a very unique, oneself as a unique expression, not egoic, but we have unique gifts to offer, mm -hmm. a unique kind of vibratory signature that's recognizable immediately as distinct, but not egoic not referring to separation, just a unique expression. And when we meet people on that level, on this more soulful level as a metaphor, there's a sense of great personal intimacy. It's, uh, it's very, on a human personal level, it's like the most intimate 
level. And many people get fascinated with this level because of essential mm -hmm. qualities of being, and they don't realize actually there's a deeper ground, um, a non-dual or non-separate, completely non-separate level. So these are, you know, the, the metaphor of the wave and the ocean, as I lay out, and I think it's chapter one of the book, it's like our ordinary conventional consensual awareness is like the tip of the wave, separate and anxious. As we deepen into our self-intimacy, we discover this more archetypal and soulful level. And if we keep going, uh, we open to the ocean of awareness as, as well. And we realize we're all of that. We're, we're, you know, we can be this tip of the wave, we can be the base of the wave, we can be the ocean. And it's none of it is separate. So this is the oceanic expression as Simon, the oceanic <laughs> expression of a wave called John, you know, uh, Johan, whatever, Jean. Um, and, you know, you're referring to the holistic nature of, of um, what I've been teaching in my approach. And this feels very important to me because you'll find um, um, different teachers or different therapists accenting one dimension mm -hmm. or another, but we are multidimensional mm -hmm. in our expression. And it's important to fully embrace our humanity and our vulnerability and our temporality, as well as that which is unchanging, which is atemporal, which is outside of time and space. Like we are, we are the infinite having a finite ex experience. And it's important to embrace this fully. And this is our, this is the great potential we have as a human being, you know, to embrace our humanity and our divinity, if you will, and to, to live that in our ordinary life. This is a, a very important and, um, Yeah, 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 it's an essential message here yeah, yeah. because uh, from, from the brief experience I had here as Simon, I, I, I have seen, um, yeah, basically you could say two approaches to spirituality. Either it's um, like healing ourselves, all the traumas and um, like perceived limitations and basically with the, with the danger or the... the, the the possibility of making one's life about uh, fixing my like basically uh -huh. fixing myself and, and that's yes. the purpose of my existence yeah, to, uh -huh. to become a whole uh -huh. but but never seeing another perspective and and the the other uh, extreme uh, like from from my like brief experience is that everything is an illusion there there's nothing to change yeah and and that, that could lead to a very disassociate disassociated and kind of detached um yeah human experience yeah so, and so you that, and you, you you see a lot of that you know mm -hmm. people who are um you know deeply into the non-dual teachings as both as a genuine discovery but also as an avoidance mm -hmm. of their human vulnerability um and of, a, of human intimacy and all of the all that comes with that um so you know i think that was um i think you had more to say about this so i'm interrupting you uh, not at all I, I just wanted to 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 share these two tendencies yeah uh -huh. i i i also witnessed myself like sure <laughs> going with them and and also realizing that my psychological um uh, compensation tendencies uh, projected some uh -huh. kind of spiritual um um work here while i was actually just avoiding to 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 basically look at my wounds on the one side but then on the other hand i also uh, could see how i get lost in a never-ending healing spiral and um uh -huh. and with that focus just find more and more um stuff to work on course, yeah and and, and, and yeah. Then my life is about fixing it and and i never get to experience that like fundamentally like essentially there is a wholeness already. So, so um, that, that exactly. I also found so helpful from your book to, 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 to share a perspective on how you can actually combine the two. Yeah, that they, they uh -huh. don't have to exclude each other or that there's a way to 
relate those aspects to each other. Yeah, so let's talk about that because it's, it's really been important, I would say, development in my work because, you know, I, my own background, I was, you know, strongly oriented towards discovery of true nature and, you know, began meditating when I was 20 and became a TM teacher and, you know, did long courses and, um, you know, <clears throat> months and months of long meditation, pranayama, asanas and so on. But I, I discovered that I, two things. One was I was really kind of in the seeker mode of trying to, you know, achieve some state, uh, which was uh, illusory. And I was also avoiding my human vulnerability. And so, um, you know, after uh, I, I, I trained as a psychotherapist in part to know myself better and in part to make a living and be of help, be of service to others. <laughs> But I held these two for some time as sort of separate tracks, you know, the, the awakening track and the, and the self-improvement, self-transformation track. And at some point, those collapsed, the distinction. I couldn't actually differentiate between them. And I think that was just part of a maturation of my own awareness. This happened about 30 years ago. And I realized everything is an expression of consciousness, uh, no matter how shadowy, no matter how conditioned, no matter how difficult. So that was an important shift in my own orientation, not to be dualistic in this sense, <coughs> but more unitive in my understanding. And so, um, and what I, what I saw was the complementary nature of these approaches, um, that actually the more intimate we are, with our human nature and our conditioned nature, the more self-aware we are, um, the more kind of coherent a narrative we have, personal narrative, kind of a clear understanding of our past and the impacts on it. The, the, the freer the system is of trauma and early attachment ruptures or lacks of connection, the more settled uh, we feel. Like we feel more in the body, we're more in touch with our feelings, we're more coherent in our thinking and our feeling, all of which is good, you know, and it's beautiful and important work. And that kind of um, that mm, quieting uh, and growing resilience and coherence of the individual system actually allows one to sustain this open awareness more easily. However, that open awareness is always available. It's here right now as we speak. It is not bound by any condition. You know? So it's the light shining through all the time. And the more in touch we are with that, which we can call presence, uh, not present-centered attention, but presence aware of awareness, <coughs> that actually supports the unfolding of the conditioned body-mind you know, and, and assists in that process. So in that sense, they're complementary. Um, and, and an openness to both dimensions is very helpful. So that there is um, a potential downside or fixations, you know, if we get too unbalanced on either side. And you've alluded to that, you know, one is if we get too much into the self-improvement project, we're always working on ourselves, And there's always, we're postponing the essential freedom which is always here because we can work on our conditioning forever, you know, and if we're not working on our personal conditioning, we're working on our multi-generational trauma, you know, that we've inherited from <laughs> parents and grandparents and great grandparents. Right. Yeah. And when does that stop? You know, that's endless. <laughs> yeah. You know, we go back to the jungles, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. In terms of our conditioning. Yeah. So we can, you know, we can get fixated and the eye, the separate eye loves that. You know, because it's got work to do and to improve yeah. itself, and it can be and it can become a defense. You know, yeah. from opening to this this loose, luminous, radiant, infinite, loving awareness that's here, always. So that's that's a potential fixation. You know, getting stuck. On the other side, it's as you said, we can be so kind of enamored with this unbounded awareness that we become dismissive of our human experience, human relationships, human vulnerability, our emotions and our bodies, 
and it becomes very dry and we feel ourselves at a distance uh, from our ordinary human life um, and actually feeling disconnected in some way. And so it remains dualistic, you know, if we fixate overly on that. So it's about recognizing and opening to both dimensions. And in a very, <coughs> when I work with people, I like to start from presence as much as possible, just, just to touch it, just to feel into it. You know, so if they come with some issue they're interested in exploring, um, you know, some knot of tension, some difficult reactive feeling or behavior, I'll, I'll you know, we'll, we'll kind of define what that is. And then I'll say, let's put that down for a moment. You know, and take a deep breath. And notice this which is aware of thought and feeling and sensation. Not grasping, just relaxing into this awareness, this primordial awareness. Often feels like it's in the background. Let's take a minute and attune with this as you are right now. So we may spend a minute or two with this kind of resting back in and as awareness. And then from this open awareness, we welcome whatever the conditioning is that is actually wanting attention. Not that we are wanting to fix or change, but that is actually calling for attention. And we welcome it without an agenda to change. We welcome it simply to be intimate with our experience. So rather than attention going in to it, it's like we feel ourselves as an open, spacious awareness, and we welcome in our conditioning. And naturally, there's an affection and curiosity like rather than how do I change this or get rid of it, it's like, what is this that I'm experiencing? This emotion, this sensation, usually. And in that openness, in that welcoming, because there's no agenda to fix or change, there's a natural unfolding what happens. There may be, I've, I have several questions I may ask, you know, if it's a sensation and contraction, let's say in the heart area or the solar plexus or anywhere in the body, you know, there's this invitation to welcome it. And then I'll say, and when, what's in the very center of this? Don't think about it. This is a way of inviting attention you know, into the very core or center. And don't think about it, just what's in the very center. So that can assist the unfolding process so it's more um, intimate. Because, well, and I'll mention the other question may be, because often in our conditioning, there's a core limiting belief that is holding um, our reactive feelings and contractive sensations together. It's sort of a linchpin. And if, there, if there's a remaining knot in this welcoming, I'll say, is there a belief that goes with this contraction? Maybe very simple, maybe stated like in a child's language, like, I'm, I'm not enough. 
or I'm flawed. And very often just by asking the question and being quiet, a very simple but powerful belief <coughs> will arise. And then I ask, you know, this is what I call meditative heartfelt inquiry or heartfelt meditative inquiry. It's like, what's your deepest knowing about this? Don't think about it. Like you drop the question in, what is, what is my deepest knowing about this belief that I am lacking, that I'm not enough, that I am flawed? Something's deeply wrong with me. What's my deepest knowing? And here we go into a different mode of knowing, less uh, analytic and conceptual, more intuitive, more of a felt sense. Felt sense means a whole body sense of something before feelings, sensations, and thoughts have differentiated. Um, and this, I find, is a very transformative space like what is my deepest knowing so we're actually evoking that loving awareness or heart wisdom and inviting the light of a loving awareness into the conditioned body mind and what happens is very often and and it takes a little bit of it's a bit of an art in this exploration there's a sense of radiance or illumination or an obviousness that this is an irrelevant belief, that it's a lie. And then the system lights up. It's fascinating to feel. Like I was working, I, I've worked with a, a fellow in his 40s. He's an American therapist and he's been on several of my online calls and came to a retreat I did on the East Coast last month. And um, he knew that there was some belief that he was holding that was still kind of, despite, you know, a deep love for this, which we're speaking of, was still kind of um, obstructing a direct recognition. And the belief was this, that um, I'm not enough. And when he asked the question, what's my deepest knowing? And he was quiet, like within a minute, came it's a lie <laughs> and he just lit up it was very interesting to feel he felt it i felt it others could feel it too yeah. it's just like his whole system began to release and open to this mm -hmm. his true nature and um, a few days later he had a profound opening awakening uh, of the heart sense of communion with the totality of life so these core limiting beliefs are a very important part uh, of our conditioning and uh, of my work to um, inquire into from a sense of presence and not trying to think our way out of them, which is more of cognitive psychology, but to tap into this deeper knowing. And um, so these, these kind of questions, this this approach from presence of welcoming our conditioning and being curious and affectionate with it and what's in the very center or if there's a belief what's my uh, a limiting belief what's my deepest knowing i find to be very powerful uh transformative and liberating hmm. and this is this is the intersection you know of course you've been reading about it in, in the book um but it's very, it's very potent. A, a, a question ca comes, comes to mind right now and um, a perspective on this identity, this vehicle, this, this sense of separation from everything, this individuality, it, and it, like uh -huh. these core limiting beliefs, you, you could say they are creating this sense of um, individuality, which is even a human condition no otherwise like without this this these limiting beliefs at at at, at the core of this vehicle we, we could not we could not have this experience of separation 
They, Correct. So, so it seems, and I think you also write about that, that there's an existential um, aspect to these limiting beliefs. And from what I, I'm hearing right now also that they seem then at the same time a portal to experience like who we truly are like again so it, it seems like you know, um, it's interesting these are you know these obstacles are are actually portals mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know our our normal condition way of responding is to avoid them you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know to distract ourselves medicate ourselves so we don't feel or sense our experience and you know our our so-called wounds or frozen places or hurt places so we avoid them but at some point and this takes some maturity and some insight we realize you know i need to turn and face my conditioning and the surprising discovery is that these areas that we have been avoiding are fast tracks you know they are like direct routes back to our essence <laughs> and, and that's why yeah it's great you know and and it, you know i mean it's not it's always not always yeah. going to be as dramatic as the case mm -hmm. that i just told often it's kind of a gradual unveiling um because what's happened and and it's a fascinating process we have as children young children a natural sense of this um, connection with mm. the totality or our natural sense of wholeness but you know we we have to adapt to environments and often difficult environments uh, familial environments parental environments um, and in so doing um, even you know um, cultural environments large you know at school or certain you know, values of, you know, certain things that are valued and others that are not, you know, often intuition is devalued and are increasingly cognitive and <clears throat> analytic post-industrial data-driven society. Um, and so we forget, we forget this and we, we didn't, we weren't fully conscious of it to begin with, you know, and in the forgetting, there's a shutting down that happens. Uh, and that that a kind of uh, solidifying of the separate self, it's inevitable, you know. I mean, it happened to Ramana Maharshi, uh, you know, on your wall there. And when he was mm -hmm. sixteen, there was this impulse to deeply inquire, you know, as to what happens when you die, you know, when his uncle died, and um, you know, that's exceptional what he experienced. But just to say, all human beings go through this process to some degree of kind of closing down. Um, and this is a process of reopening. And so what we're doing is we're, we're actually reconnecting with these essential qualities of being that in order to adapt, we should shut down. And qualities of love, qualities of kindness, gratitude, appreciation, clarity, deep insight, um, connectedness uh, with ourselves, with others and with the whole of life. So we're recovering, we're kind of, as T.S. Eliot would say, kind of exploring and coming back to our starting point for the first time you know, and recognizing, oh yes. So that's that sense of homecoming. It's like something in us knew this all along, you know, and, it, and it's tugging on us, it's calling us. Uh, usually we, we look outside of ourselves, you know, for some sense of peace or freedom or happiness. Mm. And if we get the right circumstances, the right job, the right person, uh, then, you know, then, then I will have this. And then there's a, a maturity of understanding. No, it's not about the environment. You know, what I seek is actually in the core of my being. Mm. And then we realize, oh, it's not a state either it's like the ground of who we are and and at first we may have glimpses you know i my first glimpse came when i was with my teacher jean klein in 1986 and it was profound you know just you know and i could sustain it for about four hours 
<laughs> until I came into contact with someone. <laughs> and, and then the, the separate self reconstituted. It was very interesting. But I knew I couldn't hold on to it. There was nothing to grasp. But it was a glimpse. It was like, oh, I know this is true. And once you, once you feel that and know that, it's just like it's in your system. You know, it's like the, the, the veil has been pulled back. And that, that luminosity and that, that love and that fullness, um, wholeness, um, was never forgotten. And it, and it calls to us even more clearly. It becomes our point of orientation mm. then, as well. So it's fascinating to see when people have the courage and insight to, to face their direct experience and go directly into the center of it, how it opens up into an entirely different dimension. If we go into our shame, you know, we discover innocence. You know, mm -hmm. If we go into our sense of lack or deficiency, we discover fullness, you know, and so on. It's, it's a fascinating process. Um, and sometimes we need help, some support to do that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes it can <coughs> unfold of its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you also write about as a, like stepping right into the experience, but then also um, or having the um, between uh, respectively having the two options and either transcending them, stepping back, or stepping right into into that experience and mm -hmm. um, like. What would you what you would you say? What, like, is is that from moment to moment um, a choice or listening to oneself? Or like, what, what what is the right thing? Like, well, I think what it's was my always intuition guiding guiding me to. Well, I, right I now, think or? it's I think it's always best to step back first, mm -hmm. just as we did. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. And contact presence. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's something, you know, as a therapist, it took me a while, actually, to, to realize that because a client would come in and say, you know, I have this heartache that I would like to explore. And I'd say, okay, let's explore it. And then immediately, like, attention would go into it. And that could be fruitful. But I began to realize, let's set the foundation first, like contact a sense of being as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Then in that welcoming, it's interesting. It's, um, there can be shifts of attention. That is to say, we feel ourselves as that openness and whatever we're welcoming is just welcomed in and we, we simply witness it unfolding. And then sometimes quite spontaneously, we'll notice attention like at that point. And I think this is more to your question, like really going in like to the center of something. And that's more intuitive. It's like, you know, once from a space of openness, how attention moves, you know, whether it's more just as a holding space or more as an exploring into the center is a ebb, natural ebb and flow of attention. It depends what's being called for. What's important, um, like for instance, we've discovered working with, we've discovered a lot in the last two decades about how to work with trauma. And I mean, even four decades ago, it wasn't even taught in mm -hmm. graduate school. You know, PTSD was barely recognized and there was no methodology to effectively work with it or very few mm -hmm. with limited effectiveness. So we've learned a lot. And one of the things we learned is that if you just like go into the trauma uh, without being resourced, it actually mm -hmm. uh, can make it stronger. You know, it can, uh, it's called a trauma vortex and you can get sucked into it and it can reinforce the trauma. And so we've understood, you know, in the last two decades that it's very important to resource yourself and very important if you're going into something that's highly charged, you know, from a trauma um, to take your time, you know, and if you feel yourself getting, you know, um, overwhelmed by it, then you step out of it for a while. You know, and you let the, the system calm itself, mm -hmm. you resource yourself, then you put your, you step in again and you mm -hmm. step out. Mm -hmm. So this stepping in, stepping out 
really depends on um, the, the person, their resourcefulness, um, depends on the trauma that they're working on, and depends <coughs> if they have support also, a therapist, a counselor, a coach who's, well, coaches are not really trained in this, so um, some, someone who's familiar with working uh, with trauma. So that's a one thing, having said that, that's kind of a caution working with traumatic material. I find that if we, as say a mentor, as a counselor, um, are feel deeply at ease in ourselves with difficult conditioning and know what's on the other side of it, we can tolerate and help support someone, tolerate mm. a lot of discomfort and disorientation. Mm. Uh, which is very important to not shy away from it too. Mm -hmm. So there are some important variables here, relational, interrelational variables um, that can help support the unfolding, you know, of difficult material. So there's you can hear there's kind of an, a certain art, um, mm -hmm. particularly when we're working with very difficult conditioning, and many of us have it, you know. Many of us have it. I see, you know, I, we were talking about Ramana and, um, you know, Ramana is a kind of exemplar of opening, awakening to this awareness and abiding in and as it. And, you know, he lived, <coughs> he lived as a renunciate for much of his life and then, you know, start, started an ashram. And I must say the ashram is amazing sense of presence where Ramana, the little room kind of off the main hall where he, the Darshan mm. hall. I mean, I sat there in the late eighties, just reveling in the sense of presence. And, 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 you know, the two caves where he sat are just charged, you know, with presence. So there's something, you know, remarkable, you know, in, in, in terms of that presence is available. And there's not much in those teachings about how to how to deal with our human psychology mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as well. I, right. This is the German version. I just yeah. have it here. Be, all the be time. who you yeah. are. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so and so you see a lot of people on the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. I say a lot. I don't know how many. I don't know if it's the majority with a deep, a genuine desire to know true nature, mm -hmm. but also a desire to avoid. <laughs> this mm -hmm. uncomfortable mm -hmm. human experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important to see within oneself, you know, and it, for me, that was the case. I had a, a deep desire to know true nature. And I had also a deep desire to avoid my conditioning. And at a certain point, I saw that that was obstructive, and that I needed to turn toward my humanity and become more intimate with it. Mm -hmm in order to have a more embodied sense of this, you know, so it's not just up here or just primarily philosophical or intellectual, but is felt, you know, really in the core of one's body. So the embodiment of this is, I think, very important. Mm -hmm. It seems as, as there are almost, yeah, two motivation for spirituality. One is, um, like a, a truthful um, um, uh, motivation. I, I, I don't. I don't know how, how I should better describe it. And the other one is really to to get away from <laughs> like this this hell here. Yeah, <laughs> like, and, that's right. Yeah, and, to uh, tran to transcend, to yeah. rise above, to rise above. Yeah, and uh, this is where I think our personal integrity and vulnerability is very important um, to check inside, you know, what, what am I really experiencing? You know, am I avoiding anything mm -hmm. in my experience? Am I devaluing or dim dismissing anything in my human experience? Mm -hmm. Is there something I'm not wanting to face? You know, and, and no one else can tell us that. I mean, we can get feedback, of course, from others, but but it's primarily a movement of inner integrity, a willingness to be with 
um, whatever our experience is in, in a way that we've described, you know, that I've described intimate, non-judgmental, not trying to change it, but to be intimate with our experience. And it's, our experience is actually waiting to be met with this quality of loving awareness, you know, like, like a small child that's been left behind and frightened, you know, and, and, and sometimes cries out and causes trouble, you know, like that child wants to be embraced, wants to be understood, wants to be loved, wants to be herself or himself more fully, you know, and, and our conditioning is similar. Um, so, you know, often in transcend, transcendental spiritual traditions, whether it's Advaita or Buddhist or others, I mean, you'll see it in Western forms as well, there's a distancing, a pushing away, you know, a, a dismissing of that, like that's not important or that's lesser in some way, or that's an obstacle or obstruction. And what that does is it just, it creates a duality, a split within oneself. And so one can be very peaceful by oneself or very peaceful mm -hmm. while meditating or in the forest taking a walk. Mm -hmm. But how about relationship? How about intimate relationship? You know, how is that? You know, so this is where I think integrity uh, is very important and no one can teach us that, you know, that's something that's where I think our love of the truth on all levels is very important, right? Both absolute, like knowing, you know, knowing this love, infinite loving awareness, the love of that truth and our, the relative truth of our conditioned body mind, you know, to, to be willing to um, acknowledge that and welcome that in. Would you say this is this is the key ingredient on our spiritual pilgrimage from the head to the heart, which you refer mm -hmm. to in your book? And this this honesty about yes, where we are and yes. our intentions. Yes, yeah, I would. So you're you're alluding to another metaphor that I use, mm -hmm. which is that, that of the spiritual pilgrimage, which just for the, your listeners and viewers, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll uh, elaborate a little bit on, you know, we were familiar with, you know, in, in, in Europe, it's the Camino. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, it's actually and, pa pa passing by my house. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's can... all these, there's all these yeah, different yeah, yeah. threads, yeah. you know, that yeah, come from yeah. Germany, yeah. Switzerland, France, you mm -hmm. know, it's like a confluence, you know, and, it, mm -hmm. and they all funnel onto the Camino and northern Spain. Um, so there's a deep impulse, you know, for this, uh, to go on this journey, to purify, and to realize something more fundamental. And it takes the form of these outer pilgrimages. We see it in India with these pilgrimages to Mount Kailash, for instance, and mm -hmm. the Himalayas or, you know, temples or whatever, many versions of this religious and secular. However, the most important pilgrimage is really the shift of attention where it tends to localize here in this separate self-identity, our thoughts and our image of who we are, or to drop down into the center of the heart and even deeper, you know, down into the belly as well. So this for me is the great pilgrimage, you know, the pilgrimage of attention. And that requires a lot of clarity, like, um, you know, even though I'm speaking of the heart um, and, and those qualities of communion, unit of awareness, of profound gratitude and appreciation, a sense of oneness, you know, with the totality, a sense of natural wholeness, implicit wholeness, all of these are like revelations of the heart, but for attention actually to drop to the heart from the head means we have to see very clearly the fixations of attention that we have in terms of our thinking, in terms of our image, in terms of our self story. <coughs> self story doesn't only localize here, it, it can, it'll localize deeper in the core of the body as well. But an important dimension of it is here, 
how we think about ourselves, the story we tell about ourselves, and our relationship to thinking. You know, we're very thought based, very analytic, um, more so, I would say, than, um, you know, hunter gatherers and traditional societies. We need to, to function in a complex society. But most of us spend our, you know, we live here. And if, it's an interesting little exercise to just, you know, for viewers and listeners to, to just kind of take a moment and, and notice where is my attention seated most of the time or right now? We'll take a moment and just let people explore that question. And I think most people will discover, you know, it's kind of behind the eyes, between the ears, frontal, frontal cortex, what uh, my, my teacher Jean Klein called the factory of thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, we tend to identify there. And, and I was for many years, unknowingly. And so to differentiate awareness from thought is very important to realize that even when thoughts are not here, or even while thoughts are here, there's an underlying awareness, silent, open, lucid, unbounded. This is a very important discernment, this recognition, this differentiation of awareness from thought. And gradually, our identity begins to shift from our thinking to awareness. And more and more, we're, we feel ourselves as a witness to our thoughts, a silent witness. And then we discover there's no witness. There's no separate self witnessing. There's simply open awareness, aware of thoughts and feelings and sensations. So in this way, we disidentify from our thinking. And I, I talk about this as getting comfortable with not knowing or don't know mind. This is, you know, uh, a phrase you'll find in some Buddhist mm. teaching, for instance. Um, this, this relaxing into not knowing. Who am I? I don't know. No. That's really an honest answer. So we begin to relax into, I don't know who I am. We realize no thought can express, can contain who I really am. And it's not a failure of the mind, but the mind itself comes from awareness and it is therefore, and is inherently dualistic, concerned with objects, uh, either physical or mental objects, grasping them, controlling them, manipulating them. So it has its value, you know, in terms of ordinary functionality and, and thought is a beautiful and powerful thing, but it cannot grasp its source. And when the mind understands this, there's a kind of surrender that happens, a kind of letting go, and we can feel it as a relaxation subtly. We may or may not feel it, but I, I can sense it when it's happening, and I know others can as well. We notice the eyes are like they're not as 
grasping as hard and the ears are not as good. It's like the grasping falls away and we're more and more in a receptive mode of listening, of recept, you know, just pure receptivity or welcoming. Don't, don't know, don't know, can't know, can't grasp. Mind cannot grasp its source. Who we are is not an object, you know, so mind is not going to grasp this. And then we realize we don't need to know. We can't, we don't need to grasp what's ungraspable. And this allows for a systemic change, a shift to a different kind of intelligence, different operating system, if you will, that's more direct, more intuitive, more in the moment, you know, still uses planning as needed, but then lets it go when there's no more planning to do. And it's about the next obvious step. It's not, it's not attached to an outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is a more, you know, heart core belly uh, way of operating. So the mind becomes a very useful servant, you know, mm -hmm. it's in service to this other way of knowing more direct, more intuitive. And you know, this is when I speak of heart wisdom, what is being referred to. So when faced with a problem or a dilemma, so for instance, I'll give you an example. <laughs> Always good to have examples. So I was in Europe uh, recently. I just got back a week, a week ago. With, and I went with my wife and I came down with COVID um, shortly after I arrived, I think I picked it up in Boston. And so I had to sequester myself and, you know, I was sick for three or four days and, you know, I got better. Um, but in returning to the U S you're required to have a negative test, uh, COVID test. And my home test kept going positive <laughs> up to two days before my departure, you know? So, um, like the, and, you know, it's like, well, if I can't leave, what do I do? You know, there's all sorts of things I have to cancel and the flight and plans, and, <clears throat> but no idea how to get back. And so the mind was, you know, like, what do I do? You know, or, but it, it couldn't do anything <coughs> other than get a letter from my physician. And there was nothing else to do. So it was quiet. It was interesting. It's like, we'll see. Yeah. And then that within 24 hours of my departure, I got a negative test, mm -hmm. an official negative test. So I, you know, the green light, excuse me, <coughs> I still have a residual cough, yes, but it was yes. a good example, you know, of just the mind had no more work to do. And so it was quiet, but mm -hmm. this is something, one of the fears I, I see people run into a lot, which is the fear of losing control in this process, mm -hmm. because it's like, we are letting go into something much more primal, foundational, right? And the mind says, is this safe? How will this work? Will I pay the bills? You know, will I be, you know, how will I do it? How will I function if I'm not in control? Well, the answer is quite beautifully, <laughs> quite elegantly and economically, and uh, it leaves a, a lot more room for spontaneity, you know, and inner freedom. So we don't become stupid, you know, we don't become dysfunctional. Um, but that shift, you know, into a place of real surrender, openness, availability, trust, no matter what, uh, is 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 part of this path a deepening more and more into this and, and the heart the shift from the head to the heart is um, a critical step in that direction mm. well yeah i have to say thank you thank you thank you so much for yeah taking the time and um yeah sharing some of your experiences and wisdom with us and I think at the end of your book, you are talking of three broad 
uh, stages in regards to the, the spiritual pilgrimage. And um, if I recall that correctly, the last stage you are describing um, as an ongoing, basically open-ended, never-ending uh -huh. progress of basically embodying. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, first step, I think, is orienting. Like, you know, I'm just that little description I was giving is like the mind begins to orient to its source mm -hmm. and realizes, oh, this is how this works. You know, it's like you, 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 you realize this is about really understanding the nature of the mind and the limit limitations of it and letting go and trusting and, and falling into and falling back into something much more fundamental. Mm -hmm. So the mind is oriented. You know, the second step is, you know, we begin to have openings to this, you know, it kind of flashes uh, intuitions and, and it becomes increasingly accessible, mm. you know, and, and there's a shift of our identity from separate self wave tip to recognizing our oceanic nature as being fundamental. And the third step is the embodiment of that. And that to me, my experience of it and, and my experience of everyone else that I know, some of whom are very well-known teachers, is that oh, that's open-ended. Mm. It's like the, the body-mind, you know, uh, continues to acclimate, mm. to, to open to that and allowing the light of awareness to shine with more and more clarity and intensity in our ordinary human life. And and in that it's a process of emptying out deep unlearning and the more that we empty out the more available we are and then there's an upwelling you know from really it feels as if it can be a downpouring and an upwelling but definitely an upwelling an outpouring of this fundamental awareness uh, and we find our we find our lives are about the sharing, the, the living of this, the spontaneous sharing. It doesn't mean we have to be a teacher, not at all. You know, that we may be moved to do that. We may have a, you know, a certain capacity to do that, but it, it will be shared in our life in a creative way, mm. you know, whatever we're doing in our relationships and our work. Um, <clears throat> and I think this, this is very fulfilling, you mm. know, not just to recognize this, but to live it, you know, with increasing, um, um, creativity and aliveness and authenticity and to me that's it feels open-ended i mean i can't i can't say that there is i have not found an end to this <laughs> no, it just keeps opening mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. keeps opening mm. hmm. well thank you john friend i guess uh, so much for taking the time to yeah speak to us today and um, yeah inspiring and guiding us towards our true self and um, sure. yeah I, I would you have a last message or some last words to you want to share with our audience or um, yeah. you, you don't have to but if there's something you well know. I would say <clears throat> if people are interested in uh, this approach and with working with me uh, I do. I do have a website, listeningfromsilence.com, or you can just put in my name, John Prendergast, PhD, and you'll find it. Um, so I do have, you know, I list events. Um, I've been doing a lot of online teaching, and so for people in Europe, you know, that's uh, courses are sometimes available. I'll do retreats, or <clears throat> and then uh, I'm beginning to do in-person retreats. Uh, also, mm -hmm. once again, um, mm -hmm. after several years mm -hmm. with COVID. Um, and I think the, the books are very useful guides, uh, not only The Deep Heart, but In Touch, uh, an earlier book, which is more about the felt sense of this truth, how the body uh, has a feel or sense of this unfolding true nature. Um, so that's um, you know, a useful way to deepen uh, into this. So there's just that. That's kind of the, you know, if people want to connect more. 
you know, in terms of a final message, it's more of a feeling that comes of gratitude. Just profound gratitude to know this uh, and to have discovered this, uh, to share this with others is a delight to be with you, Simon. It's beautiful. You know, Likewise, I, yeah. I feel your depth and your openness. And I, I feel very grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, for you, but also to to our listener listeners and our audience, I will add all the resources, your web page, the book links, uh, to the description of this conversation, so that everybody is very much invited um, to learn more about you, to get in touch if um, if, if they might want want to do so, and. Um, yeah, that that's that. Yeah, thank thank you again so much for being here with us, and I really wish you uh, all the best. Um, yeah, also for the future, and um, yeah, to you, the audience. Yeah, thank you for being curious and uh, yeah, spending this time today here with us. So it's it's been a delight, Simon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>